Episode 6. The pigs had set aside the harness room as a headquarters for themselves. Here, in the evenings, they studied blacksmithing, carpentering, and other necessary arts from books which they had brought out of the farmhouse. Snowball also busied himself with organizing the other animals into what he called animal committees. He was indefatigable at this. He formed the Egg Production Committee for the hens, the Clean Tails League for the cows, the Wild Comrades Re-Education Committee. The object of this was to tame the rats and rabbits the whiter wool movement for the sheep, and various others, besides instituting classes in reading and writing. On the whole, these projects were a failure. The attempt to tame the wild creatures, for instance, broke down almost immediately. They continued to behave very much as before, and when treated with generosity, simply took advantage of it. The cat joined the re-education committee and was very active in it for some days. She was seen one day sitting on a roof and talking to some sparrows who were just out of her reach. She was telling them that all animals were now comrades and that any sparrow who chose could come and perch on her paw. But the sparrows kept their distance. The reading and writing classes, however, were a great success. By the autumn, almost every animal on the farm was literate in some degree. Now, as for the pigs, they could already read and write perfectly. The dogs learned to read fairly well, but were not interested in reading anything except the Seven Commandments. Muriel, the goat, could read somewhat better than the dogs, and sometimes used to read to the others in the evenings from scraps of newspaper which she found on the rubbish heap. Benjamin could read as well as any pig, but never exercised his faculty. So far as he knew, he said, there was nothing worth reading. Clover learned the whole alphabet, but could not put words together. Boxer could not get beyond the letter D. He would trace out A, B, C, D in the dust with his great hoof, and then would stand staring at the letters with his ears back, sometimes shaking his forelock, trying with all his might to remember what came next, and never succeeding. On several occasions, indeed, he did learn E, F, G, H, but by the time he knew them, it was always discovered that he had forgotten A, B, C, and D. Finally, he decided to be content with the first four letters, and used to write them out once or twice every day to refresh his memory. Molly refused to learn any but the six letters which spelled her own name. She would form these very neatly out of pieces of twig, and would then decorate them with a flower or two and walk around them, admiring the effect. None of the other animals on the farm could get further than the letter A. It was also found that the stupider animals, such as the sheep, hens, and ducks, were unable to learn the Seven Commandments by heart. After much thought, Snowball declared that the Seven Commandments could, in effect, be reduced to a single maxim, namely, Four legs good, two legs bad. This, he said, contained the essential principle of animalism. Whoever had thoroughly grasped it would be safe from human influences. The birds at first objected, since it seemed to them they also had two legs. But Snowball proved to them this was not so. A bird's wing, comrades, he said, is an organ of propulsion and not of manipulation. It should therefore be regarded as a leg. The distinguishing mark of man is the hand, the instrument with which he does all his mischief. 
The birds did not understand Snowball's long words, but they accepted his explanation. And as the humbler animals set to work to learn the new maxim by heart, four legs good, two legs bad, was inscribed on the end wall of the barn, above the seven commandments, and in bigger letters. When they had once got it by heart, the sheep developed a great liking for this maxim, and often as they lay in the field they would all start bleating, Four legs good, two legs bad, four legs good, two legs bad, and keep it up for hours on end, never growing tired of it. Napoleon took no interest in Snowball's committees. He said that the education of the young was more important than anything that could be done for those who were already grown up. It happened that Jessie and Bluebell had both whelped soon after the hay harvest, giving birth between them to nine sturdy puppies. As soon as they were weaned, Napoleon took them away from their mothers, saying that he would make himself responsible for their education. He took them up into a loft which could only be reached by a ladder from the harness room and there kept them in such seclusion that the rest of the farm soon forgot their existence. The mystery of where the milk went to was soon cleared up. It was mixed every day into the pig's mash. The early apples were now ripening, and the grass of the orchard was littered with windfalls. Now the animals had assumed, as a matter of course, that these would be shared out equally. One day, however, the order went forth that all the windfalls were to be collected and brought to the harness room for the use of the pigs. At this, some of the other animals murmured, but it was no use. All the pigs were in full agreement on this point, even Snowball and Napoleon. Squealer was sent out to make the necessary explanations to the others. Comrades, he cried, you do not imagine, I hope, that we pigs are doing this in a spirit of selfishness and privilege. <laughs> Many of us actually dislike milk and apples. I dislike them myself. Our sole object in taking these things is to preserve our health. Milk and apples, this has been proved by science, comrades, contain substances absolutely necessary to the well-being of a pig. We pigs are brain workers. The whole management and organization of this farm depends on us. Day and night we are watching out for your welfare. It is for your sake that we drink that milk and eat those apples. Do you know what would happen if we pigs failed in our duty? Jones would come back. Yes, Jones would come back. Surely, comrades, cried Squealer, almost pleadingly, skipping from side to side and whisking his tail. Surely there is no one among you who wants to see Jones come back. Now, if there was one thing that the animals were completely certain of, it was that they did not want Jones back. When it was put them in this light, they had no more to say. The importance of keeping the pigs in good health was all too obvious. So it was agreed without further argument that the milk and the windfall apples, and also the main crop of apples when they ripened, should be reserved for the pigs alone. End of chapter 3